Good morning, church. It is uh, certainly great to see those here, and we appreciate you uh, that are joining us online this morning. I do want to give a quick shout out to Matthew. Uh, if you know Matthew very well, he's probably more uncomfortable listening to a sermon than he is giving it. Normally, if I'm speaking, he's away in another town, but he's still speaking. So this will be a new experience for him. But uh, we wish you well. Hope you uh, get well and are back soon, Matthew. Uh, this next slide I want to show you, I want to see if you can tell me the commercial or the product that it's selling. It may date a few of us because it, uh, it actually came out in the early 70s, but it's been redone a couple of times. As soon as I get my clicker to work. There we go. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. That's the real thing. Now, I'm not sure how much uh, in Coke is actually real, but at least enough of us uh, had heard that commercial that at the time it was out, we knew if you heard somebody say the real thing, that they were talking about Coke and not Pepsi. But the question becomes on how valid you consider that commercial. Do you consider that test credible? Well, one thing for certain in our culture today is that we have a credibility crisis. It's not just politicians that say one thing and do another. It's becoming more and more difficult to know what is real and what isn't. As Christians, we are called to a standard that demands credibility. You would not take your child to a doctor that you did not believe to be a real doctor. Well, in this world, if, they are, if people are going to get a glimpse of Christ, of the real Christ, then they must see it in the people that wear his name. I've come to really appreciate the book of James. I think a good slogan for the book could be the real thing, because James talks so much about the behavior and the speech of a Christian. He seems to be a man of few words. I think James kind of says, you know, why say in 20 chapters what I can say in five? Especially if you look in most of our Bibles, those five chapters cover about five pages. He calls a sin a sin, and James doesn't let us shirk our responsibility for our actions or our inactions. But much of his teaching has been compared to wisdom literature, such as Proverbs. And while he may not use a lot of words, James says a lot with the words that he does use. He offers us instructions on a variety of issues, each tended, intended to help uh, individuals in the community understand what being a Christian looks like, what it means to be the real thing. In the first uh, half of chapter 1, he introduces some thoughts on trials, perseverance, wisdom, humility, talks about the struggles between the haves and the have-nots. But we're going to pick up for our text today in chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. We're going to go down through uh, verse 26. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, excuse me, deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. As with any letter, we get only one side of this conversation. But there's obviously some issues that I think James is trying to confront here. Uh, this short text that we have, I want us to look at two things that James highlights. And when he speaks of how a Christian can deceive themselves, how we can deceive ourselves. 
The first instant James refers to deceiving ourselves is in verse 22 when he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, it's clear that his audience knew the word that James was speaking about. We know from the very first verse of chapter 1 that he's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to those who have heard the word uh, spoken to them. So these teachings are not new. And the way James writes also, if you read his whole, it's very quick, very pointed, very sharp comments, very indicative of somebody that's uh, more of a corrective type than it is a new teaching. And then we have the latter part of verse 21 that we read where he says to accept the word planted in you. So it's clear that they have heard the word, but apparently they needed reminding of it. Possibly they had not been living it. Too often, I think, we are quick to congratulate ourselves on our knowledge of Scripture. And if that is where we stop, then that is self-deception. Knowledge is simply the prelude to action. I can think of a couple of ways that we might be susceptible to being hearers of the word only and not doers. One is in the way we study. When I was back in school about six years ago, I was reading more of the Bible, more books on the Bible, more books on ministry for literally hours and hours a week. But on more than one occasion, I noticed that I did not feel any closer to God in doing that. It is easy for us to read and to study, yet be lacking the humility required to change. Without change, studying scripture is simply an academic exercise. Second way is how we might possibly devalue scripture. Now, I think all of us would claim that we honor and value God's word. But if we rest and are content on what we had heard in the past, then that's a sure path to self-deception. James would insist, I think, that the words printed on the page of our Bible have no value unless they are put into practice. We demonstrate the value of Scripture in our life by how much time we spend with it, and whether we allow it to transform us to be more like Christ. And the third way I think we can uh, be hearers only is when we mistake emotion for obedience. The next time you read a passage that really speaks to you, or you hear a lesson or a sermon that you think uh, moves you, we need to ask the question, moves me to do what? The Word of God does not call us just to feel. It calls us to do. If we feel a passage is speaking to us, but it's not calling for change or growth or for us to go and act, then we probably need to have our hearing checked. But James also gives us a couple of figures of speech, if you will, to help us understand what God's Word, uh, to help believers understand the role of, of God's Word. One is, he refers to it as planted. He says, he talks about accepting the word planted in you. You might recall that Jesus himself referred to the word as a seed, a seed that will not grow unless it's planted in good soil. Have you ever had that bag of potatoes that you leave in the pantry too long and it starts to sprout? But do they grow more potatoes? No, they just begin to rot over time. Forgive the pun, but there are no couch potato Christians. The Bible says that the Word of God is alive and active, but that is not when it sits on the printed page. It is only when it lives in our hearts and our minds and it begins to change us. The second uh, picture that James gives us is the Word of God as a mirror a mirror that clearly reflects the condition of the one who looks in it. Most of us, I suspect, either walk by or intentionally look in a mirror at least once a day. And I think it would be wise to reflect, uh, to see our reflection against the backdrop of Scripture with at least that same frequency. If you look at what the Word of God is telling you, and then you turn away and do your own thing, James would say that you are deceiving yourself. 
Now, from this, James says in verse 25, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. God's word is perfect. It gives freedom. It gives liberty. And those that do what it says will be blessed in what they do. Too often the word uh, obedience connotates something restrictive, uh, something, something harsh. But obedience to God is the exact opposite. Obedience to God demonstrates our faith. And we find blessing in that very process of honoring God through our behavior. Now, the second way that James says we deceive ourselves is in how we control our tongue. Verse 26, he says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Now, if we were to read ahead, we would see that James has a lot to say about the use of our tongue, and he pulls no punches. Over in chapter 3, he says, the tongue is small, but it boasts great power. He compares it to a small spark that burns an entire forest, something that we are quite familiar with in this part of the country. He calls the tongue a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. Says it corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it itself set on fire by hell. In chapter 3, verse 8, he says, No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. To which James says of this, My brothers and sisters, this should not be. We see evidence of this truth flooding TV and social media Every day, there is so much unrest in our country, people spewing hate, fueling division. And if we engage in the hateful rhetoric that's so prevalent around us, then our religion is worthless, just as James says. In verse 19 uh, of James 1, we read of the value of being quick to listen and slow to speak. One of those proverbial sayings that uh, we maybe don't practice as often as we should. In our culture, and I'm including Christians uh, in that culture, everyone has an opinion and everyone feels the right or the need to share it. Without a doubt, uh, the skill of listening, that art uh, has become a lost art. The concept of listening as a skill is something that would have been uh, much more esteemed in the first century uh, than it certainly is in our culture today. It was well known throughout not only the, the Jewish Christians, but throughout the entire Gentile world. Uh, there are multiple historians and philosophers that if you read their work, they use the same terminology uh, in their writings that we read in Scripture. Um, and, and over and over again, those historical teachings, they highlight the value that's placed on listening over speaking. Quite often, they uh, equate the, the skill of listening to wisdom. But even if we limited our discussion to just what the Jewish Christians might have been familiar with, uh, these teachings still would have been uh, very, very common, very familiar. And it's good to keep in mind sometimes that the people at this time, they often weren't even able to read this, or they didn't have a copy of the scriptures to take home with them. So they quite literally learned from hearing, from listening. A few examples. Proverbs 1, let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. Proverbs 13, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Proverbs 15, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame, Proverbs 18. Proverbs 29, 20, do you see someone who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for them. And then finally, Ecclesiastes 5, 
Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven. You are on earth. So let your words be few. Now, I think most of us have probably heard of the Greek philosopher Socrates, lived about 400 B.C. around that time period. Well, there's a story attributed to him about a young man who went to Socrates and he asked to be taught the art of oratory, the skill of public speaking. On being introduced to the philosopher, the story goes that the young man talked so incessantly that Socrates said he was going to charge double his normal fees. And the young man said, well, why charge me double? To which Socrates replied, because I must teach you two sciences. The first, how to hold your tongue, and the second, how to speak. I wonder if this might be exactly what James is trying to tell us, that if you'll stop, stop talking long enough, the Lord has something to say that you might want to hear. Our speech reflects our heart. It reveals truth or it hides it. It affirms people or it belittles them. It will nurture or destroy. And when James places the importance on listening over that of speaking, he's not just talking about listening in general, but specifically the benefit of listening to God's word as opposed to just speaking our own. God does not speak to exercise his voice but to exercise us, to change us. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, you might recall when the Lord was calling Samuel, Eli tells him to go lie down. And if you hear the Lord call, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Sometimes we need to lie still and make sure we are ready to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. When other times I wonder if our prayer life especially might be Listen, Lord, your servant speaks. When you go to the doctor, one of the things he has you do is stick out your tongue so he can look in your mouth. They can tell a lot about your health by looking at your tongue and the environment surrounding your tongue and your mouth. They can see evidence of bacteria and infections and diabetes and even uh, vitamin deficiencies. Well, I think James is telling us to stick out our tongue. It will tell us if we're dealing with the real thing or an imposter. And much of the next four chapters in James are devoted to telling his audience what it looks like to do what the word says. And a large chunk of that teaching targets the tongue, our speech. Our everyday speech is a barometer of our heart. It indicates whether we are truly praising God or whether we are people who are easily provoked and irritated. And I think James would argue that failing to listen and contemplate our thoughts before speaking is a behavior that does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. In other words, there's a direct correlation between our listening, our speaking, and our righteousness before God. And to not acknowledge that, to not work on that, James would say, is deceiving ourselves. Now, I suspect that uh, these two areas, our speech and our actions, sound so simple on the surface. Many of us may say, uh, yep, I've heard that, bought the book, saw the movie, and I've already heard that sermon. But let's consider a possibility for a second of why James may have been writing these things in the first place. And I propose that he did not care that they had heard this message before. In fact, I think part of his directness is specifically because they had heard the message before. But for one reason or another, they needed reminding of it. Our challenge is to avoid self-deception by allowing the words of Scripture to be planted in our heart, for Scripture to bring about change in our words and our actions, and for our words and actions to be our witness to a world that needs examples of Christ-like love and mercy now more than ever. The world is searching for some answer to abuse and racism and conflict and hate, 
And that search will continue to be in vain until they encounter Jesus through God's word. And it's the voice of the church. It is our voice that steers them in that direction. I want to encourage us all to let the word of God take root in your heart. Let the Holy Spirit nourish and feed it. Let it grow, be the source that drives you to speak words of grace and mercy and to be a doer of the word. The peace, love, and forgiveness that we all desire originated from God. So it seems to only make sense that that's where we will go to find it. Once I believe Christ is my hope, then I show my faith by doing what he says. And that begins with baptism. From the very first day that the church was established, the people were taught about Jesus and what he did for them. And when they heard it, they asked the question, what must we do to be saved? And they were told, repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And that is exactly what they did, 3,000 of them that very day. And if you have not made that decision, then we hope that you do so today. Others of us may be those that James is speaking to. We know the word, but our words and action uh, may have shown us to not be the real thing. But whatever your situation, I encourage you to commit or recommit your life to Christ today as we stand and sing this song together.